Um,
gentlemen, you guys, you ready to rock and roll? Are we are? Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'm, I was born ready. I love it. All right, so I'm going to start. Hey, let me just do this quick. Let me do that real quick. I is this? Get you back up here. Is this one on? Because I'm going to use this. Yep. Oh, that one is on, so but I won't turn this one on. Yeah, but you, yeah, you can just talk into that one over there if you want. You don't have to come anywhere near the podium. Oh, or, oh yes. Podium. Oh, that. Okay. Yes, then don't turn it on until after. I always have to stand on my tiptoes. Me too. I really taller than that. <laughs> Not by much. Oh, they glued it. You got a few people straggling in? Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back from lunch. So it's the first post-carbs session. How many ate your dessert? How many ate dessert first in case we all get hit by a meteor? You never know. Always eat dessert first. I'm Brandis Hall with the RAB. Welcome to Getting It All Done Without Losing Your Mind. It is possible. Uh, we would like to remind you to silence your cell phones and things like that because some of us have turned them back on to uh, deal with things back at the station. You know, the minute you left, somebody's hair caught on fire and somebody else moved the tower without telling you. So uh, at the end of the session, we do invite you to take a moment. Please rate this session. You can also do likes and things like that on the radio show mobile app, which is running awesome this year. If you're old school and would rather you know, do it on a little card, we have some cards in the back, and you can do you know, paper and pen. At 4 o'clock this afternoon, please do join us in the Lone Star Ballroom for our headliner, Radio's New Strategies and New Platforms with Fred Jacobs, Jacobs Media, and he's going to talk about how radio can optimize its in-car presence. Uh, Steve Goldstein of Amplify Media and Kirk uh, Minahaney from WEEI. Uh, in Boston, he will be discussing podcasting. So if you'd like to, some people are like, okay, I know what it is, but I'm not sure what to do with it. Uh, he shows you ways to monetize podcasting and have a, just have a good time with it. Uh, also, uh, do stop in the Marketplace exhibits. There's some fun booths there. Uh, many of them have candy, you know, Hershey's Kisses with Caramel, People Bait. They have that out there for you. Uh, there's a Ford Fusion, a new one in uh, booth 417 you can check out. Because in that car is a demonstration of the smart device link, Apple CarPlay, uh, Android Auto, some of the new digital stuff that's appearing in the dashboard. So it'll be fun to get to fool around with that without a salesperson trying to pressure you to actually buy the car. Uh, all the new ways your listeners are accessing radio in the dash. So I'd uh, love to have you uh, spend a few minutes with the Ford Fusion demonstration. Now I'd like to introduce today's uh, moderator for our panel, Sonia Katz-Ungerman, who has been in radio, oh my gosh, 30 years now? So she was like 12 when she started <laughs> a year. Uh, she <laughs> She's worked in promotions. She has spent about uh, 12 years in sales in the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and uh, uh, worked in, the, in sales management uh, now. And so uh, she's learned a lot about managing up, managing down, and trying to get everything done with people yelling at you. So uh, she loves helping and growing sales talent and helping clients grow their business. So Sonia, take it away. Okay, so I'm going to use this one, but I'm short, so bear with me. Um, give you a quick uh, rundown on the format. I'm going to do an introduction here of our two great speakers that I'm very excited to hear from myself, and I'm sure all of you are as well. Uh, they are going to do uh, each 15, about 15 minutes apiece, close to that. They'll be walking around to keep you awake and engaged, and then we will have hopefully 15 more minutes for Q&A which I'll be back to, uh, to help you with. Before I do their introduction, I want to make sure that everyone knows before you leave to grab a book. The two of them have written a book together, and everyone is invited to have a copy on the way out at this door. Um, so this session, I'm glad to see a pretty full room because I think we're all struggling with all we have to do and no more hours in the day to do it. First, I'd like to introduce our Sean McBride, our Shog McBride is an attorney, CPA, and business strategist. His mission in life is to help successful private businesses build companies that stand the test of time, which includes making sure that the members of the team are on career paths that they love. He's taken it upon himself to find out what really works and what doesn't, 
When he's not speaking, writing his next book, consulting with a client, or playing with his antique cars, he's probably working on his 50-state tour of businesses where he is traveling throughout the U.S. to see what American business is doing right. He also is active on social media under the brand McBride for Business, where he helps business owners and leaders achieve their goals. Through his community outreach and client work, he's seen the good and bad of business management and profiled common business mistakes in his first book, Business Blunders. He's here today to share tips and tricks on time management from his second book with Shannon, Greg, who's also here, called It's About Time to Propel Your Career Plans to the Next Level. Now let me tell you about Shannon J. Gregg. Shannon is an officiato of sales technology to increase efficiencies in the sales process and an early adapter and adoption influencer for sales technology systems, particularly Salesforce.com and technology that integrates with the Salesforce platform. Shannon is known as a change agent, particularly in M&A environments, with successful track record of integrating process, product, service type pricing, and pr service pricing and pricing methodologies, and notab notably global teams with cultural sensitivity. Lots of words. Good <laughs> Having stood up three sales operations teams in technology firms, Shannon is no stranger to the needs of a growing company to identify efficient and effective sales process in order to drive revenue as quickly as possible. She's hyper-focused on improving sales produ productivity and optimization and is known for her ability to hone in on areas to improve with a lean approach and her charismatic candor. Shannon's a full-time head of sales operations and she also provides keynote talks, consulting and workshops on sales productivity. She's excited to showcase some of the learnings that she and our Sean, Sean McBride detail in their book, It's About Time. So here we go. Thank you. So Michael was in the early days of his career. He was finishing up his education. He was looking for that perfect job. He looked on the internet, he looked at networking events, and he looked at the local bar. Maybe he wasn't looking for the job at the local bar, but he needed some stress relief. And then one day, after searching and searching and searching, he found that perfect career path. How many of us have been in that place? You're looking, you're looking, you're looking, and then you find that perfect answer. You know, you know you're going the right direction, the next move is going to be the one. So Michael began his career, and he worked at the company. And he had people that were two and three years senior to them, and they told him the way. They showed him the path. If you do these things, you're going to be successful. You're going to be happy. You're going to get where you want to go. And he also got a mentor, Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones was a legend in the industry, well regarded, and he was there to personally mentor Michael through his career. Mr. Jones was a happy man. He had just gotten married, or should I say remarried. His first wife wasn't happy with his hours at the office or the way he was doing things, but the second wife seemed to get the deal. And they were getting along well. Michael saw lots of photos of them at the beach with their huge boat, their massive house, and Michael knew that he was on the path to success if he just followed this path. Year one, year two, year three, Michael was doing the hard work, the things he needed to do to advance his career. Sure, he had some weekend plans that he had to cancel with his friends, the occasional late night at the office, but he was getting to that point of happiness if he just kept doing the things he needed to do. He was still meeting with Mr. Jones. They would have their meetings. They were a little less frequent. Mr. Jones was busy. Michael was busy. But he was on the path of success. He was doing what everybody told him to do to get to success. Year four, year five, year six. It had been a while since Michael had had a vacation. He's working a lot of hours, a lot of intensity, but everybody was telling him he was doing the right things. Mr. Jones knew it. He told him, keep doing what you're doing, Michael. You're doing great work for the company. We're getting to the right place. Keep working hard. The conversations with Mr. Jones were changing a little bit. It was no longer so much about Michael's career, but about some personal struggles Mr. Jones was having. He didn't get to see the kids enough, and he fought with his ex-wife. But he kept telling Michael, you're on the path to success, as did the others. Year seven, year eight, 
year nine of his career, and now Michael's wondering, where's that happiness you promised me? I've done the things you've told me to do. I've run my career the way you said I should, and I'm not happy. Who's experienced something like this or something similar in your career? Several of you. And that's what we're here today to talk about. How do you manage your time? How do you manage your career? And I'm doing a speech on time management, and I just spent several minutes telling you a fictional story about a guy who was unhappy about his career. Why do you think I start with that, rather than giving you some tip about time management? Anybody have any idea why I'm starting with a story about a career progression, rather than giving you some magic answer on time management? Yes? You need to know why. Right. Exactly. Any other ideas? Relatable. Relatable. Yeah. That's right. We all have been in these places where somebody has a magic answer and tells us, if we manage our time this way, we're going to get there. If we do this, success will come. Why? Why, why are you doing what you're doing? Where are you headed? And that is such an important concept. We all need to have that vision or that map of where we want to end up. It is pointless to have tactics and tips on how to manage time and what to do to get more hours of the day unless we understand what's important. Because what we're going to talk about today, a lot of it's going to come down to prioritization, picking what's important, and really knowing where your time should be spent. That is the underlying principle. And then Shannon's going to get into some of the real productivity tips, the things she does with her clients to really implement that. But we really need to start with that foundation. And sitting here in the radio industry, there can be no more intense place for time management than this. Not only do we have the changing environment, the changing world around us, increasing demands, internet, you know, podcasts, all the new mediums that are competing and changing things, but we also have a very time-oriented industry. We have schedules, we have deadlines, we have very set things that are increasing those demands. So this is a perfect boiling pot of time management pressure. So what do we do and how do we build it? We need to start with why. And if you're the type of person that says, hey, I wish I had a couple more hours in a day, how many people fall in that category? If I only had two or three more hours, I would get it all done. Truth is, you're not going to get two or three more hours. And if you're constantly saying that, if you're constantly saying, I wish I had another hour or two, I wish I could do another, another thing in the day, I wish I could get just one more task done, you've got a deeper problem. It comes down to priorities. You've got to sit down and figure out what are truly the critical tasks. So many times when I work with clients, when I work with organizations that aren't getting where they're going, that are struggling, when I pull it apart, what I have behind the scenes is a lack of prioritization. People have not made a decision of what they want to do and what they don't want to do. What are the important tasks? What are not the important tasks? The easy way to mask a problem with time management is just to spend more hours and do more and spin your wheels more. What really needs to be done is a fundamental analysis of what's important. So that's why I start with a story, because we need to understand really what's important in our careers and our lives and where we're going. We need to have a clear vision of what is important to us so that then we can build those time management tools to help us execute on what's important to us. So there's no one simple answer. How many of you have bought some book or guide on time management? Anybody been disappointed with the outcome or the results of it? Right. Why, why were you disappointed? It was hard to follow through. Yes. After this long laundry list of items that okay. did not seem to fit in with who I was. It didn't fit with you, right? So some author had a methodology which you attempted to follow and it probably didn't work. Who else was frustrated with time management tools? Yes, sir. I think the uh, very first one of those many books I read, yep. the one minute manager, yes. after reading it, I realized this guy goes to his office twice a day and does no right. and he works for eight hours. Yes. It doesn't, exist. it doesn't work in your world, right? It doesn't work probably in this industry because your phone's ringing off the hook, you have instant emergencies, you have real problems to deal with, right? And that's what we've seen. You know, Shannon and I have studied this, we work with people in different aspects of executing their business plans, and that's what we found is all these things are formulaic, right? 
Um, one, of the, one of the best selling books on time management tells you to make time management folders, put everything in by a tickler on different dates. But that assumes you're coming to the same office every day, right? A lot of us are road warriors. We're out different places. We're meeting with different people. It doesn't work. So what we really need to do is we need to dig in and figure out what is us individually. So this is very individualistic. And I'm not going to give you a blanket answer of how to manage your time today. Shannon's going to give you productivity tools. But again, you've got to figure out what tools are you. So how many of you feel like you have a busy life? You've got a lot going on, right? All of us do, right? And I know the feeling. I mean, there is intense pressure in my world, you know, as a speaker, as a business consultant, attorney. Well, I'm constantly dealing with you know, too many phone calls, too many times, so I know exactly where you're at, right? And you probably have a busy schedule, right? Your time is full, too much to do, seems like every minute's scheduled. And then the whirlwind happens, right? You're managing your schedule, you've got your day planned out, and something happens to disrupt it, right? I know. And it's my world too, right? I mean, I run three businesses. I have a business strategy firm, I have a law firm, and I run a small publishing company. So I'm seeing this. I'm a lawyer in 12 states. I'm a CPA in three states. I've got a lot to maintain, right? There's a lot going on in my world. So I know it. And I've been a failure. I'm here to tell you because I failed at this before. I have mismanaged my time. I work for the big law firms. I've fallen asleep at my desk, literally, on a conference call, 3 o'clock in the morning, trying to finish up a deal. Everybody else was talking, and I fell asleep. So. I know the fallout of not keeping the priorities right. I know what happens when you don't think about time. So I'm not here to be Superman and tell you I have every answer. But what I will tell you is we need to have a principle-based approach to our time, and we really need to dig deep about who we are before we start implementing solutions for time. We need to know what's important to us, what our priorities are, and how we really want our lives to look where we want to go. And that's where it starts. We need a plan. Where do we go? I talk in terms of a 10-year vision. I want people to know what you want your life to look like in 10 years. You need to stop and think about what's important to you. Where do you want to be spending your time? Where do you want to live geographically? What do you want to be engaged in a typical day? This is the first cornerstone of figuring out what today looks like. You need to know what your tomorrow is going to look like. And you need to look far out. I want people looking 10 years in the future. Why do you think I tell people to look so far in the future? Why am I saying don't look one year, two years down the road? What did you say? Go ahead. It's okay. No? Okay. Okay. It's okay. It's allowed. It's a safe, it's a safe room. Um, I want people looking far into the future because if you, so many people make plans based on one year or two years. And that leads to accidental outcomes. Because we, if we plan for one year or two years at a time, we are drifting with the wind. This would be much like getting in an airplane and having the pilot keep selecting the best winds to go the fastest on each segment of the flight. And while that would get you somewhere quickly, you may end up in a completely unintended location. You need to know where you want to end up, and you need to course correct to get to where you're going. So the first important thing is to have a plan. And then you've got to pay attention to the plan. Once you have that plan, once you know what's you, what you want your life to look like, what your career goals are, what your family goals are outside of life, now we want to start building a plan to get there. And we need to keep paying attention to it, because there's going to be distractions. There's going to be problems. Your laptop's going to break in, before an important meeting. You know, I've been on the road. It happened to you? Laptop broke? I see you're pointing. Yeah. I uh, was in a hotel room in California waiting for a meeting, and I uh, got up early in the morning. I tend to be an early riser, and I plugged the power plug into the wrong port, and I blew out the motherboard, uh, and I had to go run out and buy another laptop, right? I mean, th these things are going to happen. We, we are humans. Things are going to happen. You're going to have disruptions on your plan, but you've got to stay with that dream and that vision of where you're going. And at some point, you have to delegate. You have to get other people involved. And part of this depends on your organization. What's your radio station like? What's your company like? But you need to get tools and resources to move things. It could be technology. It doesn't have to necessarily be a human being that you're delegating to. But you're going to have to start thinking about what you do best. What is your core 
power? What do you do really well? What do you add value to the world with? And you want to start focusing your time and attention on the things that you do best. And the things that you don't do best, you need to start getting them off your plate. This is going to free up time for you to do more of what you're great at, which is going to lead to more economic value, more help to your employer, more help to your clients, and you're going to be moving the right direction. And you've got to stop and dream. And this is a step that a lot of people miss. You start working your plan, you implement that great time management book that you read, and you keep working and working and working without stopping to think about where are you going. So you've got to revisit that dream and that plan of where you want to go, because otherwise you're going to get lost. And then you've got to apply filters. Make sure you know how you're spending your time. Are you doing the things that are really important? Are you filtering out the things that are unimportant? And this is part of that priority. This is why we have to have that big vision before we start getting into detailed time management techniques, because we need to know what we really want to be doing and where we really want to spend our time. Once we have that, it's about prioritizing and always keeping that dream that you have in the center of your time management strategy. You always need to be looking at where you want to go and looking at what you're doing. This becomes a super powerful tool. One of the best things you can do in time management is say no. Turn opportunities down. Walk away from things, because all those opportunities eat up your time. And you, if you have a clear vision of where you're going and what your dream is, it becomes very easy for you to say no to things that are not consistent with where you want to be. Say no to those things. Say yes to the things that are consistent with where you want to go. You've got to reset your dreams periodically. You want to revisit, make sure you understand it. Your, your understanding of the world may change over time. You want to revisit your plan. So don't just keep executing, revisit. Get help. I'm a big fan of coaching, outside advice. So find somebody that can help you manage your time, somebody that can come in to your world, look over what you're doing, make sure that you are following your plan, and give you tips and tricks along the way. Get comfortable with those dreams and keep working those dreams. And you refine and improve. You're constantly changing, updating, and improving what you're doing. And a lot's possible. You know, we're offering a copy of the book today. It's about time. Shannon and I wrote this. It is largely a summary and details of this presentation. And I just met Shannon in May. So this tells you what's possible if you manage your time. We met and we wrote a book in three months, and it's become very popular. Our online community has been quite active, and we're really helping a lot of people with time management. But that just shows you what is possible if you really dig into your strategies and know what you're doing. You can write a book in three months and still run a business. She's still working her normal career. I'm working my normal career. So it's your floor, Shannon. All right, so let's tickle your right brain for a minute and imagine with me, and if you need to close your eyes because it's the post-lunch slump, go ahead and do that, I won't tell anybody. Imagine that it's 2022, that's just five years from now. And imagine that five years from now, you're at the radio show, it's not here because it's a lot bigger five years from now because there's a lot more people. And you're sitting next to your same friends, those ones you get to see once a year, you're so excited to see them. And they look at you and they say, hey, Rich, what's going on? You look so much more calm. You look better. You look rested. Have you had work done? What are you using on your face right now? And you say, no. On September 6, 2017, I made the decision to take charge of my time. I made the decision to stop saying, I'm so busy, and greeting everybody with, I wish I had more hours in the day. Because let's be real with ourselves, if you had more, you'd fill them up, right? If you had more, you'd find something else to do. You'd pick up another hobby. You'd watch all of the episodes of America, America's Got Talent and then The Voice or whatever it is you're filling your time with. So think about today. If you want to be that person in five years, to come here and say, check me out. I'm looking good. I'm feeling good. I feel largely in control. We're going to discuss a few steps today that you can take in order to be that person that now takes control of your time and your priorities. And one of the things that, that Sean and I really wanted to focus on is making sure that it was you-based. Because if I stand here and tell you exactly what works for me, it's not going to work for you. You hit the nail on the head. Did he pay you for that? 
Uh, I'm Shannon Gregg, and I'm so excited to be with you today. I'm from Pittsburgh, and I work as a full-time head of business development operations, which means I'm the nerd in the sales department that loves technology and CRM and marketing automation. Are there any other nerds in here, sales and marketing nerds? All right, cool. I'm the lone nerd in the room. It's fine. Is anybody here a sales manager? Anybody in charge of quotas and territories? All right, good. I'm going to be talking to you a lot today. Um, I've been managing inside sales teams for a really long time, and, and I can tell you there's nobody that's more frightened at the end of a quarter than somebody in sales, right? Because you've got a target on your back, and if you miss third quarter, you get to pick up that and add it to fourth quarter, which already seemed pretty crazy. And I'll tell you what, the end of every three months is like a time where you feel like, not only do I not, not have enough time, I'm not sure if I'm still going to have a job. So sales is a place where we really have to be in control of, of our productivity. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the Golden Triangle. Has anybody heard of the Golden Triangle? So this is based on some Toyota stuff from the 80s. And you know, Toyota in, invented lean. And I think lean sounds really scary. It sounds very engineery. It doesn't sound like it's for salespeople because we like art. There's an art of a sale. Every customer is a little bit different. Your approach has to be different. You're prospecting them. You're trying to figure out what's going to drive them to close. What's their value proposition? How can I best give them the return on investment? And so having a system doesn't feel right there either. But it's nice to have something to refer back to to say, OK, I understand where I can go if I've traveled down a path that doesn't seem to be right. So the Golden Triangle is based on um, some 1965 management work done by Harold Levitt, who came up with Levitt's diamond. And really, what goes into the Golden Triangle is people, process, and technology. So there's a little chicken and egg situation here in that your people have to follow a process and technology needs to enable that process. But if you decide to implement technology and then change your process to match it, the people are going to revolt, right? They don't want you to come in and say, change the way you do everything because we bought this brand new CRM system. Anybody using a CRM system? Yeah, that's a challenge, right? When somebody comes in and says, you sit down and you're not people that are used to sitting down all day. You sit down and you learn how we do this technology and this is the way you do it now and we're gonna watch everything you're doing. That doesn't feel good, right? So when you think about this golden triangle, think about like a three-legged stool. Who's ever sat at a restaurant and there's like 20 sugar packets tucked underneath one of the legs and your drinks are sliding off anyway? That's what happens to the golden triangle if one of the legs is a little bit off. So, the first thing that I want to talk about with you is people and whether they're eager. Who loves change? Who's like, yes, change is the absolute best? Okay, you guys are what I would call early adopters or innovators. If you've ever heard of the um, technology of diffusion or the diffusion model, these are the people that wait in line for the iPhone 8, right? They read that, they're like, yes, I'm going to sit outside for a couple days because I need to have it. You don't even know why. You're just change agents. Most people, though, 80% of people, don't fall in that category. Most people, they, they're sitting in the bell curve saying, like, I'll wait until that iPhone 8 gets its headphone jack back, and, and then I'll be there. Yeah. I'll join you then. So you have to look at people and say, what's in it for them? And anybody that was here this morning heard this reference to WIFM. And that's really what it comes down to when you're trying to motivate people. So if you're a sales manager, Obviously, one of our biggest WIFMs is commission, right? I mean, that, that is something that's real. But apart from just saying, hey, you can line your pockets with more money, which we all want to do, what else is in it for them? Can you find more available selling time so that your people are spending less time doing, doing administrative tasks and more time closing business? Can you find a better way for them to prospect so that they're not constantly digging up articles and looking on LinkedIn and ZoomInfo to find out, you know, did Mary Pat move from this job to this job and how can I get her to buy from me again? So think about the WIFM when you're looking at people. And if you're rolling out something new, if you've got a new technology, a new system to sign into, uh, think about those adult learner styles. Is anybody familiar with VAC, the VAC? So this is um, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. So you've got people that love to learn by seeing. Those are the ones that like to see it. And then they, they think about it, and they put it into play. 
You have auditory learners. Those are the ones, anybody like podcasts or listening to books on tape, you're probably an auditory learner. And then kinesthetic learners, which salespeople usually are. Those are your hands-on people. Show me how to do it. Show me how you do it. Let me do it and tell, let me tell you how it's wrong. So whenever you're rolling out new training, you have to think about all of those people because they're all on your team. They're not all kinesthetic learners. They're not all visual learners. So think about the way you'll roll out a new program or a new method of attack and how you're going to be you know, tracking metrics and KPIs to make sure that people are doing exactly what you want them to do, which is reach those sales quotas. The next is process. So process is one of my favorite things. I could talk about that forever, but uh, I was pretty much promised by Sonia they'd drag me off if I talk for too long. So I want to talk about the five whys. I think that's a really important thing for you to think about. And you can use this as managers, as salespeople, or you can use this in your personal life also. It allows you to be very left-brained and logical about the way you're thinking about a new process. So you start with your problem, and then you ask yourself why five times, and you'll generally get to the root cause. So you'll say, um, my salespeople don't have enough time. I'm, I'm not productive enough as a salesperson. OK? Why? Well, they're asking me to do too many things. They want me to you know, sell um, to my current customers, and they want me to service my current customers, and they want me to find new customers, and they just redistricted our territories, and I have to prospect, and you know, my phone's ringing off the hook, and nobody understands what time I'm done with work. OK, why? Well, we're down a person. And while we're down a person, we're trying to find somebody else. And when we're done with that person, we're going to plug them into exactly what that other person was doing. Why? We've never thought about getting to the bottom of the job description and thinking about if we should stratify our sales team and find one person who strictly does prospecting and hands those qualified leads onto a more senior salesperson who can close it. Why? That's just the way we've always done it. And that will help you get to the bottom to say, OK, that's just the way we've always done it, is what's keeping our salespeople from doing all the things that they need to do at the time they need to do it. So that will allow you to get to the root cause and say, what is the problem I'm actually trying to solve? Because solving this problem, my salespeople can't do all the things they need to do, is boiling the ocean, right? That's impossible. So the next thing that I think we can talk about is technology. So I heard a lot of talk this morning about digital, and um, I saw a really nice description uh, uh, painted for us of the, this hipster millennial digital tech technology-focused salesperson, but we're all using technology. I mean, who has a smartphone? Yeah, everybody has a smartphone. So I think what, what scares people about technology is learning something new and changing the way you do it to fit the technology. And that's where that part of the golden triangle comes in. So if you can say, OK, uh, here's, how I like to, here's how I like to sell. I love to take post-it notes, and I like to move them along my wall, and I love to use Excel, and I actually have these little Lego people, and this represents a prospect, and this is somebody who said they're going to buy. However you like to do it, that's OK. Nobody, nobody should take that away from you. But it's how do you use your technology to take that system that already works for you, and this comes back to why most of the time management books you've read don't work. Take your system that works and put it into the technology. Uh, one of the things that I do personally is use a Google Calendar to manage my home calendar to say, hey, this is what we're doing. You know, we have this birthday party to go to, or here's our wedding. And using that Google Calendar at home has solved a lot of home problems. So think about the ways you're already using technology to make your process better and make people work the way that you need them to. And that will help you to be more productive and more predictable, really, because that's what it's about, right? Being efficient and effective. And there's a difference. I can be really efficient in something, but it could be the wrong method, so I also want to be effective. So in closing, before we go to our Q&A, and we do have a community microphone here, and we're hoping that you have a lot of questions. We're here to answer specific, if you have a specific challenge right now, or just a general challenge, we're happy to help you with that. But I want to encourage you to do more of what matters, because we only have one life. And I'm sure every one of you can think of something that happened that was tragic or something that you saw on the news. And God bless everybody in Texas right now that has been affected by Hurricane Harvey. Think about what matters. How can you reprioritize your time and how can you manage your time to be productive so that you can do the things that matter to you, right? So we're looking forward to your questions and I thank you so much for being with us today.
and ask questions. Otherwise, I have some of my own. We're not that scary. <laughs> Hi, Angie Valderas, Intravision, Sacramento. I have uh, managed four radio stations. Well, actually, it'll be eight now. And so one of the things that, one of the challenges that I have is people constantly coming to my office, um, you know, interruptions. And so some of the ways that in the past I've done this is, you know, I will give people exclusive, what I call exclusive time, and I make it really inconvenient for them. So, like, I'll meet you at 7 in the morning, you know, and you can ask me whatever you want. And that seems to have cut down, but now that I have, you know, I have 60 employees in my building, and so without just shutting my door, and sometimes I just hate doing that, just having my door shut, I was just looking for maybe some more people-friendly ways of, of, of blocking that out. Otherwise, I will be there on Saturday doing all my work that I didn't get done during the week, which I do often. Yep. Um, you want to take it first? I'll go first, and okay. then I think Shannon will have a different answer than me because you know, we, we know each other's styles. What I do is I do have dedicated times where I focus. There's a lot of research out there that shows that if you keep interrupting your thought patterns and you keep responding to emails or phone calls or this interruption or that interruption, you actually do not get into the depth of thought. You know, and, and in all of our worlds, as being professionals, as, be, as adding great value to the world, we really need to get into that depth of thought. There's issues you need to think critically about that you're going to need to dig into. So you need a block of time. You need an hour to two hours to fully process things sometimes. And that needs to be uninterrupted time. Because if you work for 15 minutes, then respond to a phone call, work for 15 minutes, respond, you're not going to get to the same depth of concentration. You're not going to get to the same answers. So it's critical that you do that. Now you need to do it in a way that works with your team. So you do have to have time where you can focus. Your team needs time where they can focus. And then you need to make, you know, it doesn't have to be 7 o'clock in the morning. But there, it's OK for you to have a two-hour block of time where you are in your office and you're only answering to absolute emergencies and your team needs to carry the ball while you're there so that you can have that depth of thought and do the strategic thinking you want to do. Otherwise, you're going to end up on a hamster wheel. You're never going to get that deeper things. You're never going to move to another level because you're not going to be able to process. So I think it's perfectly OK to say, don't interrupt me during these two hours. I will be available during these two hours. Such a great question. Um, first, I'll ask you, do you have regularly scheduled one-on-ones with the people who report to you? Sure. Yes, so it sounds like you're doing a good job of mitigating the challenge by having one-on-one -on -one scheduled. Um, so some, some of it is coaching and saying to them, that's such a good question for our one-on-one. -on -one. Let's save that until Tuesday at 4.45. Um, another part, a, a suggestion that I'll give you is to have office hours. So my open office hours are from 3 to 4 on Tuesday and Thursday. If you have a random question, come during office hours. That's a great way to entertain it. And then I think the other thing that you can do really is start to build a peer network and say, you know what, this person had that exact same question. Why don't you guys try to focus on that before you bring it to me? And see if you can then build leaders that way underneath you who can feel like they're, they're able to handle those problems before they come to you. Yes, and sometimes as managers, we, we create a culture of learned helplessness. This is beyond time <laughs> management. But if, if we're too accessible and our people can come to us for answers, rather than trying to find the answer on their own, they'll come to us as managers and expect us to answer it for them. We need, to, we need to cut that process off and force them to think and come up with solutions. So I'm just going to add on one thing, which I love these answers, and that is um, we live in that world. And I, as a sales manager of two stations, 
I, I have an open door policy. I try not to close my door, but what happens is then I end up doing my job after everyone goes home, right? Um, so what I did, and, and Shannon and uh, Sean both spoke to this, is I tell them to come to my door if and only if they can't come up with a solution, or to approach me when they have solutions because that'll make the meeting go much faster. If they just have a quick question, they're dependent on me all the time for the answers, that's time wasting. What I find happen is if they come to my door and say, and I, I can't help them because I have a forecast due or something else, I tell them, come back uh, or I'll contact you when I'm ready and nine out of 10 times, they've already found their solution. So I would just do more of that, otherwise you're right, we're setting up an environment where they can't move without you know, they can't make a move without us approving, so. Absolutely. Anyone else have a question? Step up. Thank you. <laughs> Hi there. Um, my name is Jenna. I'm an account executive at Steel City Media in Pittsburgh. Um, so I am the person in the office who has the rep, oops, sorry. <laughs> um, I'm the person in the office who has the reputation to be a dog with a bone, um, which can sometimes be a good thing and a bad thing, I think. Um, and Mr. McBride, when you mentioned spinning your wheels, that's got me written all over it. So, <laughs> so I wanted to ask, is there a clear-cut way that perhaps I can do a better job of identifying real opportunities. I am thankful that my sales managers look at me as the person who will call the client that no one wants to deal with and follow up on lead after lead after lead. But at the same time, as I flew out here this morning, I was given you know, 12 leads via email, and I just don't know when I'm getting to them. Yep. <laughs> so how can I define better opportunities for myself? So first I'll ask you, are you an optimist? Would no. you consider yourself to be an optimist? No. <laughs> I think generally optimists are the ones who find themselves in this kind of hamster wheel because they're like, I can get it all done. I really can. I can do that. Um, so it's interesting because I feel like you, you probably exhibit those characteristics. So I think when leads are being given to you, it's important to understand how you score, how you weight those leads. So if they're coming from somebody in marketing, for example, and you find that they're not qualifying them heavily enough for you to know, like, what's my priority lead, right? If you have 12, you can't call all 12 people at the same time, but you can kind of say, here's a demographic of what I think is a good lead, or push back on marketing and say, I need you to qualify this a little bit more. You know, I need their last name. I, underst I need to understand their company. Um, you know, what's, what's their demographic? How much money are they making? And, and it's okay for you to assign those sorts of scores and say, if they've bought from us before, you know, that ranks them up in the priority list. Um, if we already have some type of master agreement and I know that they can sign the contract faster, that ranks them up. And so you can come up with your own sort of method to say, Jenna, this makes more sense to me. This smells like a hotter lead. I'm going to chase this faster. And, and as you do it a little bit more and you can add that sort of science to it, you'll be able to say, great, I respect this lead. You know, number 9 through 12 are great, but I can only do so much prospecting in a day, and so I have to make sure that the ones that, that reach the top are the most qualified. Yeah, and you're, you're really cheating your long-term development by not having a scoring system because that, that gives you a process that you can enhance over time. If you start using a scoring system, you'll start seeing where the good spots and the bad spots are in the scoring system. You can start removing bad prospects, start identifying good prospects better. It's really gonna spiral in a good way for you if you start scoring them. So I really encourage you to start doing that. It's gonna to lead to great long-term dividends for you. Too many leads is an awesome problem though. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Uh, uh, Brandis, do we have time for one more? One more, okay. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Julie Warden with uh, Sinclair Communications in Norfolk. I'm a general sales manager, and uh, this isn't about my time management. This this is the time management problems of the salespeople. We they spend a lot of time, even you know, in the morning. We can't watch them like babysitters, but they're out there talking in the pit. We can tell they're wasting time. They complain about not having time. They complain about paperwork. They complain about all the things, all these excuses. But yet we hear them wasting time going to lunch with each other. I mean, the list goes on and on. So how do we corral these people and give them without just <laughs> coming on and telling them they have to take our system, how do we get them to develop their own systems? 
Yes, so this is such a familiar problem. I think probably to everybody, right? Who has this same problem? So thank you for stepping up and asking that question. You know, I think a lot of times um, your KPIs and your metrics will be helpful to say, this is how much activity I expect out of you a day. I expect this many cold calls, this many emails, this many connections on LinkedIn, what, whatever your KPIs are that, that will drive you to the end. And, and because I like to think scientifically, you know, if the goal is $10 million and I know that we have a 30% win rate, then we need $30 million in the pipeline. And in order to get $30 million in the pipeline, we have to make, you know, 1,200 calls, whatever it is. So you can say, I have 1,200 calls, there's four of you, you each have to make 300 calls. And if they're not making their calls, it's really easy to coach them in black and white and say, you only made seven calls last week. And then you're talking about their production and not their personality, because that's always a challenge. And, and you don't want to discourage some camaraderie in the office, right? It's good for them to be friendly. It, it's also good for them to have friendly competition. So I'd suggest uh, a leaderboard, something that's very visual, that says, here's who made the most calls last month, and who can beat them, right? Whoever beats them gets to park in the best parking spot, or I'll put your face on a billboard downtown, and what, whatever it is right. that's going to motivate <laughs> them. But, but I think being very open and honest about their achievements and, and thinking systematically about what you want their production to look like allows you to coach them in the frame of, here's my expectation of you, and not saying, you know, I can see you're on Facebook book or Instagram all day long, right? And right? How many dresses did you order yesterday, anyhow? And I think it's great to allow people to fail, and I think that's important, right? We, we, we can't be the savers. We don't want to be fixing everything. But here's a great opportunity to coach, right? So they're spending too much time socializing. You know they're wasting time. So at the end of the week, they're not going to hit their results. They're not going to hit their metrics. Now go back with the five whys that Shannon talked about. Ask them, why do you think you didn't reach your number? Why didn't you get more sales calls in? Why didn't you do that? And make them run through the process. It's going to be much more powerful if they self-identify that they didn't spend enough hours on the phone than if you do. So. We have to wrap. I think we, could all wel we would all welcome another hour of this, but um, thank you. Sean and Shannon are going to be at this side door. Grab a book. Uh, highly recommend and um, they're available to talk to you at the side door if you want. Thank you for joining us.